cool. And we would like to present it as an alternative to the text templating that we do um, using Go text templating in Helm. Uh, my name is Nima Caviani, and I'm a software engineer with IBM. And I'm here with my friend Dimitri Kalinin, who works at Pivotal, um, also as a software engineer. All right, um, so with Kubernetes, you know, becoming the platform for deploying applications to the cloud, and it being um, like a declarative system in which, you know, a lot of the configurations are expressed through YAML files. I think all of you know that, you know, templating and, you know, providing customizations for these um, configuration documents is actually quite popular in the community. And there are a number of platforms and a number of like tools that, you know, have evolved in this ecosystem, right? So, as I'm going to go through these and you know do a quick comparison across all of us, uh, all of these, I want to just do a check in the room and see who's used which one of these tools in the system. So, Go text templating, obviously, right? I think pretty much everyone here has used Helm, right? Who has used like overlay tools like Customize? Great. How about um, configuration languages like DAL and JSON? Cool. And there are also SDKs, right? Plumi, right? Uh, anybody using Plumi? Nice. Um, and finally, like you can do everything with a with a full blown language, right? Python or Ruby. Anybody has tried it? Great. All right. So um, we're gonna do a quick comparison of all these different tools. And you know, just a disclaimer: it's subjective, right? It's based on our perceived uh, way of you know how each one of these tools basically solves the problem. So text templating. You know, all of you are familiar with, you know, text templating um, using Go text templating, but you can also do it with Jinja. I think Capiton, for example, uses Jinja for the templating. The one primary thing with text templating is that they treat these configuration documents as text, right? Which essentially means that you have to do things like indentation, you have to do character escaping, et cetera, et cetera. And then it becomes hard when you want to actually include, um, um, like provide modularization and, you know, make libraries and include them in one another. If you're familiar, for example, with the way Helm does it, you probably have seen a lot of curly braces around, you know, functions that you have to import. And another problem is that, you know, once you start templating these documents, the, um, the syntax that you use for templating diverts from the syntax of the document itself. So you end up with, for example, writing co um, Go code inside a YAML document. Not ideal, right? But that's one option, certainly. And, you know, Helm being a super popular tool, this is one of the most common ways that people actually do templating. Overlay tools like Customize, right? So the main benefit is that it actually allows you to update configuration values. You can inject values, you can delete values, and that's all great, but the problem is that it lacks those language constructs that would allow you to do more complex things. Especially if you're a provider of these configurations, you probably want to have if conditions for different situations in your configuration file, and that's just not easy with tools like Customize one of the primary downsides. And then we have the specialized configuration languages or DSLs, right, the domain specific languages like JSON and DAW. And typically, uh, one of the um, big problems with these is that you have to learn the new language, right? It's, um, and because like there is no um, proper community support for it, usually it's that there is no editors uh, that you can actually use, right? So there's not that much tooling built around it. Um, but, um, you know, like, People seem to like JSON, for example, and they've been using it. So it's certainly out there and um, has its own group of people. And the other group is SDKs, right? Pulumi, for example, is one of the popular ones. And I think the thing with um, Pulumi or like SDKs is that they have a steep learning curve. They are way beyond providing configurations, right? In the case of Pulumi, you can do an entire deployment of the system through Pulumi. And because um, the learning curve uh, is steep, it's kind of hard for people to onboard. And also, it kind of moves away from that declarative nature of a specifying configurations, and you start actually writing programs, so it becomes more imperative. Finally, programming languages, right, Python and Ruby. Nothing stops you from actually explaining or describing the entire configuration using maps and arrays in Python and Ruby, and then dumping it out as JSON or YAML files, right? But then one of the primary problems is that there is no sandboxing around the configuration that you develop. So you have to be super careful if you want to run someone else's configuration about what this configuration is going to do to your host machine, for example, right? Also, you know, it's not very convenient to, um, 
to basically um, design more complex configurations in the form using, you know, like uh, maps and arrays in, in a custom programming language because they are just not meant for it. Um, so with all of that, I think what we've um, developed is YTT, uh, which is kind of an alternative. It's still like a templating language. But the difference is that, you know, unlike Go and text templating or other text templating languages, it's st structure aware in the sense that it understands the structure of a YAML document, it understands the node, it, un it understands the maps. And as a result, it kind of solves some of the problems that you had to deal with otherwise, like, um, you know, for example, indentation or skipping of characters. It uses a Pythonic language for templating, um, and we believe by using Python, because Python is a quite popular language, it's actually easy for people to get, get on board and start using YTT. Um, it supports both declarative and uh, imperative constructs. Um, you can have more complex conditionals and loops in your templating, very similar to how actually it's done in um, Go, text, um, Go text templating in Helm. Um, it allows for modularization of configurations. You can actually um, write functions and then you can have functions um, in separate libraries and export and reuse them. Um, it supports data injection, so you can actually provide data uh, to, the to the templated configurations. It supports a structure merging, so it actually um, provides facilities to do things that you can do with customize, like adding overlays and injecting data and removing elements from configurations. And finally, it um, provides assertions uh, that you can use in order to do validations in your configurations. Um, so that's the overall des uh, description of what B YTT is, and I'm gonna hand it to Dimitri, who's gonna talk about some of the basics. All right. Uh, <coughs> so, like Nima mentioned, it's very subjective, right? So this might not be everyone's cup of tea or cup of coffee. Uh, so this is what we typically see, right, um, you know, in Helm templating and other um, templating, um, I guess, tools. Uh, the gist of this is that we've decided to attach metadata within YAML uh, via using of comments. Uh, and, uh, you know, a typical kind of a structure, right, you might see somewhere in your YAML, right, is there some comments before the node, the YAML node. Uh, there's some comments in line to the node and there's some comments after the node. Um, now we've decided to assign some meaning uh, to those comments. Uh, so uh, as you may be familiar with the uh, annotations within Java, right? Uh, there's a little add symbol, so we kind of stole that. And we've decided to uh, kind of a break down what a typical YAML comment would look like, uh, uh, but attach some meaning to it, right? So we've broken down the annotation into two pieces. The the name part and some kind of a value part. Uh, now uh, we'll get uh, we'll get shortly into why uh <coughs> this is useful, but uh, this is how it would look like if this would be, uh, I guess, uh, uh, YTT's internal representation of what it what it sees in YAML. Now this is what typically a human would write. Uh, so the the defaulting uh, for the annotation name is happening automatically, uh, and uh, you know, as you can see over here in this example, all we're saying is there is a conditional. Uh, the conditional is wrapping the entire YAML node, <coughs> and uh, we have a value that we're trying to assign to the name node, right? Uh, now, uh, given that annotations are fairly flexible, you know, we can have different types of annotations. So there's, uh, for example, an annotation that allows us to, to say that uh, it's okay to specify the same key twice within the same map. So in this case, YAML map key override is that annotation. Uh, some annotations may also take uh, arguments uh, to what they do, right? So we view annotations as, as function calls. A and so in this particular example, we're trying to match some particular node by value of the UID key within that array element. Um, so you'll see a fuller example in a second. Um, so yeah, so how do we actually get to use that? So this is a simple, <coughs> Kubernetes example that uh, that demonstrates some of this uh, uh, some of this usage. So, uh, in this particular slide, we're showing you over here. This is how you set the value to a map uh, map item. Uh, the value comes out over here as uh, uh, you know as is, right? So, Nima mentioned that we're using a Pythonic language called uh, Starlark. Uh, it's developed by Google. 
uh, they used it in uh, Basel as well, uh, Basel build system. Uh, so it allows us to give that nice syntactic, uh, uh, you know, properties to the templating language itself. Uh, so here's another example of setting a value uh, to an array item this time. Uh, over here, note that it automatically gets escaped. Um, and <coughs> that's just the property of uh, using the YAML library to serialize, you know, what we have uh, on the left side. Right, so y as a user, you don't have to worry about putting quotes around it. You don't have to do any kind of indentation or anything like that. They're just automatically taken care of by, by uh, Go's, you know, YAML library. Um <coughs> so um, here we get a little bit uh, fancy. Uh, so in the example earlier on, I've showed that we have a if true and then and wrapping a single map item node. Um <coughs> sorry, a little bit sick. <coughs> So um, in this particular example, we have a single node restart policy. Uh, now imagine if you're doing a lot of conditionals in your template, uh, it's a little bit annoying, right, to put a, you know, if at the top and the end at the bottom, right? So we've decided to introduce this special syntactic sugar that allows us to do it in a single line. And because we attach the metadata to the YAML node, uh, it's, only <coughs> it's only applicable to the restart policy uh, map item over here. All right, so going on to the next uh, example over here, we have a for loop. A for loop uh, similarly is only attached to a single array item, so it gets looped over here. <coughs> and uh, um, given that there is uh, two services, right, on the right we generate two service uh, uh, array items. Uh, so nothing too fancy so far. Um, now, a lot of times, right, to, to actually configure your uh, all kinds of services, not you want to share some, you know, content in between them, right? Uh, so here's, we have an ability how to use a function or define a function. Uh, this function over here uh, defines two map items uh, and uh, it's being used once in this, uh, in this example, right? Now you can use it as many times as you want. Uh, and even better, you can even split that off into a separate, uh, you know, file uh, and, uh, you know, use it in any file that you import it over. Uh, you might be familiar with, if, if you're familiar with Basel build, you might see, you know, a similar kind of load instruction to load this kind of external functions. Um, as Nima mentioned earlier on, you know, overlay tools like Customize uh, have, uh, you know, particular uses, right, in configuration uh, landscape. Uh, they're typically useful for consumers of configurations to, you know, to customize their, you know, whatever they've taken up from upstream, right? Uh, typically, uh, you know, you'll, you'll see it, uh, you know, by maybe like changing a particular portion of a YAML to maybe, uh, I don't know, in Kubernetes, well, to change the image or change something else, right? Um, so we have uh, a library called Overlay, uh, that's built into YTT. Uh, and uh, we've decided to take advantage of this annotation functionality within YTT to give a more consistent way of how to insert, uh, update, and remove notes within YAML documents. Now, if you're familiar with Customize, uh, there's a different syntax, right, between updating and inserting uh, versus uh, how you remove a note, right? Because there is no way for Customize to actually uh, as a part of a document to indicate that hey, I want to remove a node. Um, now, in, in case of YTT, we actually can, you know, introduce that information. So uh, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, in this particular example, though, we have a way to update a node, right? A node over here that uh, uh, we're first indicating which documents should be selected for the update, right? So we have kind ingress. And by default, we'll only match a single document, but if you want to match multiple documents within your document set, then you can add additional arguments to this annotation to say it's okay to match multiple, right? Um, so here we select metadata, annotations, and then finally we find this key over here, yeah, Nginx ingress Kubernetes limit RPS. With YTT's knowledge of these structures, we're actually, uh, uh, we actually expect that these keys exist on the left side, right? So you can kind of, uh, view the overlaying as there is a right side, which is your updates, and then there's a left side, this existing content, right? Uh, so within those structures, we expect that those keys exist. So let's say if I typoed over here metadata without an A, it would actually fail 
can tell me that, hey, I can't find that key, the key on the left side. <coughs> now, in this particular case, because on the left side everything exists, metadata annotations, Nginx, uh, ingress annotation over here, it will successfully update. Uh, now, for inserting a node, right, as I mentioned, uh, uh, because it will fail to, to find a node, we actually have to indicate that, hey, uh, this key is missing, and that's okay. Uh, you're also able to kind of select and, uh, I guess, uh, indicate that the entire subset of three uh, may be missing, right? So this, this avoids a lot of typos. Uh, given our background working with um, Cloud Foundry configuration and whatnot, we've, uh, we've both felt that it's important to give that user, uh, give the guardrails to the user uh, as much as possible. Um, and finally, uh, for the remove, uh, so this is one of the, I guess, uh, more unique features, right? Because we're able to add these annotations to the documents, we're able to indicate in the same type of format that, hey, you're able to remove a particular node out of the, uh, you know, out of the left side. Uh, so it's not in any way different from inserting or updating, just have to add an additional annotation. Um, all right. All right, so um, I think by now you know that essentially YTT combines templating and overlays. And one of the primary reasons we decided to provide both functionalities in YTT was that as we were thinking about you know, the users of um, the tool, we identified two separate personas. One is the providers of the configuration and one is the consumers of the configuration. And for the providers, you can think of the, them as um, people who actually, you know, provide these configurations and put them out. And essentially what they need is like stronger uh, language constructs, right? More powerful language constructs because they want to give their users options. That's why they need um, facilities like loops and conditionals in uh, when specifying their configurations and the templates, right? But on the other hand, we have the consumers and one of the primary things with consumers that we notice in the community is that oftentimes it happens that there are cases where they want to use um, configurations from the upstream, but they do not have, like for example, like there are some requirements that they have which is missing from what is available in the upstream, right? And they need to do that modification. Now, uh, with YTT allowing them to actually overlay the their own requirements on top of what is already available you know, from the upstream, they can actually have the flexibility to use the same tool that is used for, for um, templating to also use it for overlay and adding their own, their own uh, requirements. So um, when using um, templating, for example, like the, the way YTT is actually implemented to use templates and overlays is that, for example, you can think of uh, downloading the upstream configurations that the provider has already supplied and then you provide your own values um, that allow you to basically adjust the provided configuration to your own needs. But if you want to add extra customizations through overlays, it's gonna be yet another set of files that you're gonna pass to YTT. And the combination of all three would eventually produce the set of configurations that you require. Um, now, the way we, we um, think um, cur currently it is possible with Helm is that you have to do Helm template of your chart get the configurations and then apply YTT with the overlays that you require in order to do the modifications. One of the ideal cases that we envision is that if at some point it is allowed for this type of um, functionality to be included in Helm, you can actually combine all three in one instead, right? You can do the same templating um, um, and applying of the values and then pass your overlays. In fact, what is interesting, and I think I want to bring it to your attention, is that a while ago, Dimitri and I submitted a proposal to make the template in engine pluggable uh, for Helm. And the goal was that if uh, this becomes possible and when this becomes possible, hopefully we can take the GoTex templating out and replace it with YTT so that all the features that we explained here and we believe um, is going to make the lives of the users of Helm easier can be used by basically using the plugin engine. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go back to this and hand it off to Dimitri, who's gonna be talking about um, 
some more details of the language itself. Uh, I think it is here, right? Yeah, right. Demos. Yeah. Yeah. Um. <coughs> so I, I don't know how much, I think five more minutes is, is all we got. Uh, so I'm just gonna point out to a few examples that we have in the repository and uh, you know, if you guys uh, are curious, you know, take a look at it. Uh, all of these examples are under uh, uh, K14S. That's our kind of a little open source umbrella uh, where we just put lots of you know tiny projects under. Um, so YDT examples. That's the directory. Uh, so the example that <coughs> I think uh, might be useful to to show is a quite common uh, question that shows up uh, in uh, Kubernetes Slack or just from my coworkers. Is hey, I have a, I have a username and a password. Uh, I need to for a Docker registry. I need to make a um, Kubernetes YAML configuration for it. Uh, I don't want to run a separate command kubectl, whatever, to create it because I'm using all of this configuration files and whatnot. How do I do it? So with YTT, given that you have the, you know, a uh, few built-in libraries uh, with what the YTT library uh, YTT binary ships with. Uh, you're able to do something like this. Um, <coughs> and hopefully, bump that up a little bit. Uh <coughs> so as you can see over here, uh, this this template just uses JSON base 64 and uh, data. Data is the library that we use to read the values in from what's been injected into the templates. And here's just basic uh, configuration that typically people either do manually or through bash script or by using the kubectl create uh, registry, I think secret. Uh, so yeah, all this is really doing is just uh, throwing in base64 in code with the values that's been injected uh, and then throwing it into a little map over here uh, and then finally uh, encoding it again. Uh, and I guess uh, after it, JSON encoded this. Uh, so this is uh, quite an easy example that um, uh, solves potentially annoying problem of automation for at least some of the users of Kubernetes. Uh, and uh, it was somewhat, at least for me, delightfully easy to uh, to do in YTT when I first did this as an example for someone else. Um <coughs> I think um, maybe I'll scroll through a few examples over here. Uh, so recently I was taking a look at a vault uh, helm chart, I think, uh, that was recently released by HashiCorp. So I pulled out a few examples that I was kind of uh, 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 I was kind of looking at and seeing kind of how does the go templating compared with the with the YTT templating so uh, plus is just indicate the separator kind of before after so this is a basic little example right you're uh, you're just trying to uh, you know add a little prefix with a string and use a function uh, that's how that works out uh, there is some code that uh, Vault Helm chart contained to uh, calculate some of the values for uh, how much, uh, how many pods is it okay to be unavailable at a time. So this I feel like is a little bit more readable than whatever is going on over here. Um, we got a few, uh <coughs> we got a few, I guess, uh, uh, config map operations going on over here. Uh, I, when I was doing some Helm charts, when I was creating some Helm charts, I always find it annoying to figure out what the indentations are and if I screw up tabs and spaces and all that. Not. So that kind of gets rid of some of this stuff over here, cleans that up. <coughs> and then, uh, you know, there's some conditionals that you've seen before, uh, not too exciting. Um, what else is going on here? Uh, there's some looping and adding the, you know, X number of array items based on whatever user has entered into their X3 environment variables. Uh, that's, uh, I don't, I don't know if there's anything exciting going on here. <coughs> ah, this is actually a very interesting example. So I noticed when, uh, I was, uh, converting the Wild Helm chart to YTT that all over the place there was a conditional added to every single file that had, uh, you know, if global is enabled, then do the code, otherwise don't do anything, right? So supposedly someone just needed for some reason some global flag to turn the entire to turn to turn off the entire thing off. So one uh, one interesting combination that you can do with YTT is you can actually apply an overlay to remove all of the documents out of the document set that's been rendered, right? And uh, uh, that's kind of a short way of doing it, right? If if you're not enabled, 
then match all of the documents and then finally remove them and uh, that's pretty much it so i found that kind of neat example of that um so yeah i don't think uh um uh i guess maybe one more example if i have a little bit of time uh so I've experimented with uh, pulling out some of the genetic configuration for a typical stateless app into a separate library. Uh, we call it Kate's Lib. Uh, what you can do with this, right, is because YTT, you know, is able to load, you know, libraries from your file system, right? Is you know, Git clone the separate repo, kind of vendor it in, and you know, include it in. <laughs> uh, and um, this library provides a handy method of saying app dot make, and app dot make takes a name and takes your container configuration over here, right? Container configuration could be as simple as that, uh, and takes a port. Uh, now, what that gets you is that gets you a deployment, horizontal pod auto scaler, service, ingress, all of the typical stuff that an organization may want, right? The idea is not necessarily for everyone to use this as a, as a library, but rather, uh, you know, one, you can kind of decide for your own organization what that library could be, right? And have all your teams use it, Genetically, and two is uh, maybe even just uh, to uh, uh, to have something more, uh, uh, I guess, abstract, right, than your own, you know, individual applications. Uh, now you may have a question. Well, uh, what about all the other configuration that I may want to customize? Well, that's where overlays come in, right? You can use overlay uh, functionality from the from the overlay library over here, and you can actually customize any part of that base level configuration if you really want to. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I think that really covers the demos given our time. Um, thank you very much for attending our talk. Uh, we're, I don't know if we have time for questions via the mic, but if not, then, uh, we're going to be here for the rest of the day. Uh, please do come talk to us. Thank you. <coughs>